Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're gonna deep dive into starting fires. Oh yeah. Specifically when you don't have matches or a lighter. <laughs> like out in the wilderness. Right, right. We've got a ton of survival blogs, prepping articles, yeah. even some stuff for like regular camping and hiking. Cool. So it's going to be interesting to see the different approaches. Mm -hmm. It really makes you think, if you were stranded, no phone, no gear, uh -huh. could you make fire happen? It's a real test. You know, we take fire for granted. Totally. Like flick a switch, light the stove, mm -hmm. easy. Yeah. But out there, it's different. You got to be resourceful. It's almost primal, right? right? Absolutely, and that's where the science comes in. Yeah, like right. we've all heard the fire triangle, right? Right. Fuel, oxygen, heat. But it's more than just a saying. It's like the foundation. Exactly. Yeah. That's how fire works. Combustion. It's a chemical reaction. Okay, so break that down for us. Fuel and oxygen. They need heat to react. And once they do... It keeps going. Yeah, the heat from the reaction keeps fueling more reaction. Oh, so it's like a loop. A chain reaction. Whoa, cool. So how do we manipulate that out in the wild? I mean... Good question. One big factor is surface area. Surface area, like the size of the wood? Kind of. Think yeah. of a log. Huge, burns forever, but tough to start. Because it's so big. It's the surface area. Small compared to its mass. Now chop that log up. Into kindling and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Suddenly, way more surface area exposed to heat, to oxygen. So the catch is easier. Much easier. Like tinder. We've got sources suggesting crazy stuff. I saw that. Orange peels, potato chips even. It sounds wild, but there's logic to it. So it's not just random? Nope. Those orange peels, they've got flammable oils. Oh, interesting. And chips. They're mostly starch. Starch yeah. is a carb, right? Mm -hmm. uh, carbs break down into carbon, hydrogen, oxygen heat that up and boom fire basically they combine with oxygen in the air release energy as heat and light so my snack could save my life you never know but speaking <laughs> of snacks we got to be careful right safety first absolutely yeah. one source how to start a fire in the wild they stress this they do location matters away from overhanging branches stuff like that and using fire pits in campgrounds if they're available always and having a plan if things get out of hand water sand right yep and never leaving a fire unattended. Ever. Okay, safety covered. Now let's get to the fun stuff. The techniques. You ready to go primitive? Bring on the hand drills. All right, so hand drill, it's as basic as it gets. A spindle piece of hardwood. You spin it between your hands, right? Yep, against a fireboard. Hmm. Another piece of wood with a notch in it. Friction makes the heat. Exactly, makes wood dust too, fine yeah. stuff. That, with enough heat, oxygen, it'll smolder and eventually ignite. Mm -hmm. Key is the right wood, downward pressure. And keeping that spinning going. Consistent motion is key. It's tough, though. I bet. It takes practice. Oh, yeah. Patience, stamina, even some blisters, probably. Oh, I remember bitch. my first try. Rough. But eventually, you get that smoke. That little wisp of hope. And then glowing ember. <laughs> it's rewarding. I can imagine it's like connecting to our ancestors. Totally. They relied on this stuff. Speaking of which, fire plow. Similar idea. Fire plow. How's that work? Friction again. But instead of spinning, you're plowing a groove. With another piece of wood. Harder wood, yeah. Makes wood dust that piles up at the end. So it's like concentrating the heat. And the fuel. But you need the right woods, the right angle. And a lot of muscle. It's not easy. Reminds me of... You know, rubbing sticks together as a kid. Oh, yeah. Seems so simple, but... It's way harder than it looks. So the fire plow is like the grown-up version. More controlled, definitely. And then there's the bow drill. Bow drill. Isn't that like the most efficient of these? It's definitely a step up from the hand drill. Yeah. You've got the fireboard, the socket. Socket? What's that? It's either a stone or a piece of hardwood with a dip in it. Ah. Guides the spindle. Oh, okay. So it spins better. Smoother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it keeps the pressure. Then you've got the bow, the cord. It's going to make it spin faster. Way faster. And the cordage ties it all together. So it's like a whole system. It is. And each part matters. The bow gives you speed. The socket keeps it steady. Cool. But I'm still a little confused about this socket and notch. Sure. So picture the fireboard. The notch is a little V-shaped cut near the edge. Oh, okay. The spindle spins in that notch, grinding against it. That's where the dust comes from. Ah, I get it. The socket sits on top of the spindle, guiding it, keeping it from wobbling. It's like a helper. Exactly. So with the bow drill, you're spinning way faster, more consistent. So just with your hands. Way faster. Yeah. Which means quicker embers. It's like power tools for fire. Uh-huh. 
basically. <laughs> okay, so we've done the primitive methods. What about the modern stuff, the ones with everyday items? Right, like fire from ice. That one's always a shocker. I know. How can you start a fire with ice? It's all about the sun. You shape the ice into a lens. A lens. Yeah, to focus sunlight. It creates a super hot beam, like a magnifying glass. So you're using ice to make fire. Exactly. Mm. Pretty clever, huh? And especially useful in the winter. When there's ice everywhere. Exactly. But we'll dive more into that after a quick break. Stay tuned. Oh, look. Fire from ice. Still wrapping my head around that one. It's pretty wild, right? So you're saying, like, I could find a chunk of ice? If it's clear ice, yeah. And shape it. You want to shape it into a lens, like a magnifying glass. And that'll focus the sunlight enough. Enough to get Tinder going. Yeah. It's all about that concentrated light. And that makes heat. Exactly. It's basic physics, but applied in a cool way. So it's like survival science. Totally. And it shows, you know, there's more than one way to make fire. Speaking of which, what about that battery and steel wool trick? Oh, that's a good one. Super simple, but effective. I've heard of it, but never tried. You need a specific kind of battery, right? Nine volts the best, but others can work. It's the principle that matters. So how's it work? Does it, like, spark a lot? Yeah, you get sparks. Steel, wool, it's those thin strands of steel. Mm -hmm. Super conductive. You touch the battery terminals with it, positive and negative. And that's a short circuit? Exactly. That short circuit, it makes the steel wool heat up fast. Because it's so thin. Lots of surface area, just like we talked about. It catches tinder easily. But isn't that, like, dangerous with the battery? Could it be careful, yeah. Okay. Don't want to hold it too long. Could it explode? It could overheat, yeah, maybe rupture. Wear eye protection just in case. Right. Safety first. Good. Always good advice. So that's using electricity to make fire. Kinda, yeah. Harnessing that energy. Yeah. But what about good old sunlight? Like a magnifying glass. Exactly. Same principle as the ice lens, just a different material. Focusing the light. Yep. That curved shape, it bends the light rays, makes them concentrate. And that little point gets super hot. Hot enough for tinder, yeah. And it's not just magnifying glasses either. Really? Some sources say a water bottle can work if it's clear and full. So the shape matters more than the material. In this case, yeah. Even a clear plastic bag filled with water can do it. Wow, that's good to know. So it's all about that curved shape focusing the light. Exactly. Shows how everyday stuff can be survival tools, if you know how. Makes you see things differently. But no matter how fancy your technique is... You still need good Tinder. Right. Back to basics. What makes some Tinder better than others? It's a combo of things. Like pine needles, they're thin, lots of surface area. To catch the spark. Yeah. And they've got resin that's flammable. Birch bark, it's papery, peels easy. And that makes it good Tinder. Those thin layers, they're full of oils, burn well. Dry grasses, too. They're like... Nature's kindling. Exactly. Yeah. But the best Tinder... It depends on where you are. That makes sense. Like desert versus forest, it's got to be different. Big time. Dry desert, you might find dry grasses or inner bark from dead trees. Stuff that's already dried out. Right. But in a damp forest, got to be more careful. Birch bark's good there. Protected from the rain. Yep. Or pine needles under trees. Even bird nests, if they're dry grass. So it's like a scavenger hunt. You got to use your eyes, see what nature's providing. It's a skill. Okay, so we've got the tinder down. But what about like... The fire itself. All right, starting it's one thing, but then you got to build it up. Make it last. Exactly. And for that, we need firewood. Not just any wood, though. And it's an art to it. Backpacker magazine, they talk about this. Yep. Two main styles. Branch fires. And split wood fires. Right. Branch fires, they're good if it's dry out or below freezing. Because you can tell if the wood's dry. If it snaps clean, it's good. But if it's damp, split wood's better. I've tried burning damp wood. It's just smoky. No fun. You want that nice, clean flame split wood, you got to work for it. What do you mean? Find a dead tree, knock it down, split it open. Inside's usually dry. Ah, so it's protected. Exactly. Worth the effort in wet conditions. And gather more than you think. That's what I always mess up. It's called a fuel buffer. Backpacker emphasizes oh, that. Never run out. Especially if it's hard to find more. Exactly. And clear a space around your fire. Leave some nature untouched. Right. Respect the environment. Always. Okay, so, wood gathered. Now, how do we build the fire itself? There's different shapes, right? Like teepee, log cabin. You got it. Outdoorsy, an yeah. essential guide to fire building. They've got diagrams. Pictures help. Big time. Each shape has its purpose. Teepee, it's that cone shape. Lots of air can get in. Which means it catches fast. Log cabin, it's more stable, burns longer. Good for cooking. Or warmth all night. Mm. Lean to. That's good if it's windy. Blocks the wind. Uses a big log or rock as a shield. 
So it's not just piling wood randomly. Here's a strategy. It's about airflow, efficiency, how long you need it to burn. Makes sense. And of course, we got to talk safety again. Can't stress it enough. Oh. Top six gritty ways. Essential guide. They all agree. What are the key points? Clear space. Have water or sand ready. Follow any rules of the area. And never leave it unattended. Golden rule. You never know what can happen. How to start a fire, they even suggest. What's that? Checking out Smokey Bear's website. Mm -hmm. He's got lots of info on preventing wildfires. Good old Smokey. All right, so we've covered a lot today. Science, techniques, safety, it's all connected. Now it's time to think about how we BD use this knowledge. Put it into practice. Imagine yourself out there needing to make fire. All right, so let's say you're out there need a fire. No matches, no lighter. What do you do? It's almost like a test, right? What have we learned? Exactly. First thing, assess your surroundings. What kind of environment am I in? Is it dry, damp, windy? What resources are around? And then based on that, I choose my technique. Right. Feeling confident. Go for the bow drill. Show off those skills. Uh-huh. If I can get it to work, but maybe I play it safe. Ferrer rod. Always a good backup. Reliable. Sparks every time. Or if I'm feeling adventurous, try that battery trick. Just be careful with that one. Batteries can be unpredictable. Yeah. Learned that the hard way once. But it's amazing how many options there are. Right. From primitive to modern, it's all about using what you've got. And understanding the W-H-Y behind it. Like, that's what stuck with me. It's not just steps, it's principles. Exactly. Okay. Knowing that fire triangle, surface area, all that. It helps you adapt. Tender, techniques, it all changes based on the situation. So it's like knowledge is your real survival tool. It's the most important one. Makes you resourceful, confident. Makes you appreciate fire, too. Definitely. It's not just something we take for granted anymore. It's powerful, essential, even a little bit magical. It is. And that's a good note to end on, I think. Yeah. Respect for fire and for the knowledge to create it. So listeners, keep that fire for knowledge burning. And thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll catch you next time.